fantastic speaker today um, and uh, uh, the formal introduction will be done very soon uh, just one more piece of information we have uh, upcoming uh, seminars uh, uh, related to AI and uh, please register and those are really truly a very good people in the field uh, whoever wants more information please uh, contact Diana all right so I will stop sharing here Eric uh, you may just start loading this um, you know it's really a great uh, pleasure to have Eric joining us on a very very special day um, I met Eric many many years ago we were trying to recruit uh, him to University of Washington and uh, not successfully but you can think about Eric's uh, as incredible career he made but could you imagine if he would join us in Seattle I mean I don't know what will be uh, perhaps even all right I, I will stop here uh, you guys uh, judge by yourself and let's just move to Jennings all right. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Jennings Liu, and I'm an MD-PhD candidate in Dr. Palchewski's lab. Today, I have the great pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, the William Chatlos Professor of Ophthalmology and Director of the Ocular Genomics Institute at Harvard Medical School. He graduated magna cum laude with his undergraduate degree in biochemistry from Dartmouth College and subsequently earned his PhD in biochemistry from the University of Wisconsin-Madison before attending Harvard Medical School where he earned his medical degree. He then completed his residency in ophthalmology there at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary and his fellowship training at Boston Children's Hospital. As a clinician scientist with expertise in pediatric ophthalmology, his research has been dedicated to understanding the molecular mechanisms of inherited retinal diseases and developing therapeutic interventions for these disorders. Over the course of his career, he has served as chair of the Scientific Advisory Board for the Foundation Fighting Blindness and has received numerous honors, including the Nelson Trust Award for Retinitis Pigmentosa. Today, we have the privilege of hearing about his latest work on gene therapies for inherited retinal degenerations. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Dr. Eric Pierce. Well, thank you all for that lovely introduction, and thanks for the invitation to participate. I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but I guess this is the next best thing in our, our current world. So thank you very much. Um, as Jennings mentioned, I'm going to try to discuss our work related to genetics, understanding the genetics of inherited disorders, and using that information to develop gene and genetic therapies for these diseases. Let's see. So. Uh, always start with some disclosures. I do want to point out that I'm sure, well, I'm sure Irvine is beautiful. Boston can be lovely too, especially this time of year. Um, I'm very fortunate to do my work in the context of Ocular Genomics Institute at Mass Eye and Harvard. Our goal is precision medicine for inherited eye disorders, that is you know, starting with patients with inherited eye disease to understand their genetic cause of disease to use that information to study disease pathogenesis, and then use those pieces of information to develop gene and genetic therapies, which we bring back to patients in clinical trials. And it's a very exciting time in our field because we're actually really participating in all aspects of that translational cycle, the present which I'll try to describe. I get to work with a wonderful group of people, and I'll try to point out at least some of the contributors to this work along the way. So I think, I think all of you know that we're in an era of precision medicine in action, that the promise of gene genetic therapies is starting to be realized, and this is not just for inherited retinal disorders, although our field is helping lead the way, but there are wonderful advances in other genetic forms of disease as well. Several phase one, two clinical trials of AAV gene therapy for hemophilia have shown significant benefit, especially as shown in this image here, if you get the AAV and the type of uh, therapeutic transgene correct, you can really have a significant impact on the disease. There are trials of genome editing for sickle cell disease in progress and approved genetic therapies, not just for inherited growth disease, but also for spinal motor atrophy with antisensolic nucleotide therapy and now AAV therapy approved. So we're 
entering this era of precision medicine, and fortunately, genetic therapies are really promising their treatments for inherited retinal disorders, which is the field I work in. These are important causes of vision loss. They have pediatric through adult onset, and they're very genetically heterogeneous. So we really have a challenge in our field to bring inherited retinal diseases to all patients who are affected by these. Sorry, bring therapies uh, to all the patients affected by inherited retinal disease. One of the advantages we have in working with therapies for these diseases is we can see what's going on with retinal health, right? So here's a picture of a fundus using a wide field optos imaging camera, optic nerve at the back, the macula, and the retinal periphery. And here's an autofluorescence image really interrogating the health of the RPE. Both of these are very useful, especially when used in combination with optical coherence tomography or OCT imaging, which is really looking at in vivo histology. When we look at these layers of the retina, we're really looking at photoreceptors and RPE cells. So we can tell when these cells are sick or dying in retinal diseases. We can also combine that with psychophysical studies like visual fields here, showing full visual fields both for large bright stimulus and a small dim stimulus. And we can tell that things are different in all, all of these types of evaluations. When a patient presents with an inherited retinal disorder, here's an example of a typical rod cone degeneration. I'm going to try to stick to that terminology rather than retinitis pigmentosa, which this also has been called. And you can just see that there's something wrong on the fundus picture. Autophorescence uh, looks funky. And really, what I think is quite impressive is you can tell what's happening anatomically in the retina of this patient. They've lost the outer nuclear layer. Here you go. Um, in the, in the phobia, the outer nuclear layer here looks great, so photoreceptors are fine, but that gets quite attenuated as you get outside the phobia. And that correlates with this very constricted visual field to a smaller dimmer stimulus. So that's the correlation of night blindness. When we see patients like this, we want to, this is the time we want to intervene, either here or before this stage. Because if we don't, we know that over time, and fortunately the therapeutic opportunity here is often decades. Without treatment, the photoreceptor cells will be lost, and the patient will essentially have no functional vision. So we want to treat while there's still photoreceptors and RPE cells to treat, so we avoid progression to vision loss. So I thought I would sort of start the journey of understanding genetics and inherited health diseases and using that information to develop therapies for the case. I'm very fortunate to be a clinician scientist, so I get to see patients with these diseases as well as work on them in the lab. And this is a case of a young woman who I've known since she was a little girl when we diagnosed her with severe early onset retinal degeneration. Again, I'm going to try to stick to that sort of general terminology. This has also been called labor congenital remorse. So she's currently in ninth grade. It's remarkable how well these kids adapt. She does very well in school using Braille. She's a cane from mobility. On exam, her vision is in the light perception range, black white discrimination, light perception. She has nystagmus and she has retinal degenerative changes. But there's something really important on her exam and imaging studies. So if you look at her fundus, it doesn't look too bad. There's clearly some abnormalities in monophorescence. But to me, what's striking here is that the photoreceptor outer nuclear layer here and even perhaps some RPE are preserved. So there's structure function dissociation, right? Here's a person with light perception vision, and yet more or less intact retinal structure. So to me, this emphasizes the opportunity for therapy in patients like this. If we had a way to, if we could understand the genetic cause for disease and had a way to treat that, there's the potential to restore visual function because the, the anatomy she needs to do that, the photoreceptor cells in her V, are, at least in the macula, are present. So that's really our goal. That's what drives, certainly drives my work, and I think drives really most of the group we work with in the Lundic Institute, and of course many of you in the audience today as well. We're very fortunate that there's an opportunity to really intervene and have a positive impact on a patient like PD that I just described. The mainstay in our field for this is gene augmentation therapy, primarily using adeno-associated virus, <laughs> and I think 
Houston. I think that's the sweet spot for us, and we should push that as hard and as far as we can go, because that'll work for the great majority of inheritance mental disorders. There are some disorders caused by mutations in genes that are too large for AAV, because there's a cargo limitation for AAV of 4 to 4.5 kb. And there are also dominant diseases in some cases where there's demonstrated gain of function mechanisms for which gene augmentation isn't going to work. And again, luckily, there are technologies available to treat those types of diseases as well, which I'm going to try to describe. There's the CRISPR-Cas9, CRISPR-Cas-related technologies of genome or based on prime editing, and there's also antisense algorithmic therapies, and both of those are in clinical trials as well. There are a growing number of clinical trials of genogenic therapies for inherited retinal disorders going on. Just to give you some idea, there are clinical trials of gene augmentation therapy, AAV-based, for seven or eight different genes as listed here. There are clinical trials of innocence cell nucleotide therapies for three different forms of disease, and the clinical trial of genome editing has recently started as well. We're, I'm very fortunate to have two wonderful clinician scientists colleagues at Mass Engineer, Rachel Huckbill, she's the commander. We work together to do these clinical trials, although to be honest, Rachel really is our lead clinical trialist and does the majority of these. And it's real. and again, this is, it comes back to the point I made introducing the Ocular Genomics Institute. It's a very exciting time in our field that we're working on therapies, preclinical proof of concept for therapies in the lab, but we're also getting a chance to participate in clinical trials of some of these therapies as well. I'm sure you're all familiar with the success of RP65 gene therapy, which is now FDA approved, and we're really trying to follow that up and see how many other types of disease are amenable to therapy using that same approach and related approaches. And this has changed the way we deal with patients, right? When we see patients, we're now, I, I, I tell our fellows, every conversation is part of the recruiting subjects for clinical trials. Because even if it takes several years to understand the genetic cause of disease and eventually get a genetic therapy developed, we're talking with patients about that opportunity. And that you know, even just a little bit of cautious optimism, that little bit of hope, really changes, certainly changed my clinical practice. So if we want to really bring the promise of gene and genetic therapies to the patients we see with inherited renal disease and other inherited eye disorders, we have to understand the genetics of these disorders. So I'm going to spend the first part of my talk here talking about our work on the genetics of inherited renal disease and then try to get, I manage my time well, to the second half talking about our genetic therapies that we, one or two genetic therapies we've been working on. So for inherited retinal generation, as I said, there are about 270 disease genes known. And if you make a panel-based next-generation sequencing test, the genetic test for that, which we call JEDI, or the genetic eye disease test, and you apply that prospectively to 500 patients, which Kinga Buyakovska, faculty member in our institute, did, these are the results you get. What you see is that you can solve about 56% of patients by finding small you know, single nucleotide variants, SNVs, or small indels sort of typical mutations you find in disease genes. And that's pretty good, but obviously we want to solve more. So Kinga extended those studies and looked at copy number variants or structural variants in the genome. You get about 10% more. So we're up to about two-thirds of patients solved using, and, and that's detecting that Kinga was able to detect the copy number variants from the next generation sequencing data. So from a single test, we're able to solve about two-thirds of patients. So we have, we have applied that clinically, and a bunch of other companies have now picked that up, and it's actually offered for free by a couple of those companies through the Foundation Money Blindness. So that test is being applied widely. But of course, there's a third of patients here for whom this test does not identify the genetic cause of disease. And that's an area we are now focusing on. What's the genetic causality in that group? So it could be new disease genes. And I'm not going to go into these data, but I think the new disease genes here actually are only a small minority of that causality. I think about 2%. I think the majority of the causality, as I'll try to show you, is elusive mutations in known IRD genes. 
non-cutting mutations, things we haven't looked for, like deepentronic mutations that affect splicing, and we're not sequencing there, so we don't see those. Or structural variations in the genomes, like large deletions or duplications or insertions. And again, we have to look for those specifically in order to be able to find them. So to test that, to test the hypothesis that non-coding and structural variants, non-coding mutations and structural variants are important contributors to pathogenic alleles in inherited viral diseases, we said, well, why don't we ask in the third of patients here, for whom we didn't have a genetic diagnosis from our first round of testing, how many of them have single loss of function alleles in the coding sequences of non IRDG. It turns out it's about two thirds of that group, or 20% overall, have single loss of function alleles. So that's the low hanging fruit. Can we now do genome sequencing and find the second mutation, which we haven't been looking for previously? So Farzad Jamshidi, working with Kinga, tested that idea using six families with single loss of function mutations in the RP group 1 gene. Mutations in RP group 1 cause severe early onset metanol degeneration. People at Mass Sinai have been working on gene therapy for that for years, starting with Kansan Lee and others years ago. There's a program working towards developing gene therapy for this, so we want to know, be able to accurately identify patients who have that disease. So Prasad took these six families for which there were no other candidate disease genes via whole exome sequencing and looked for non coding and mutations to structural variants detected by PCR-free whole genome sequencing. And it's a small number, but I think what he found was quite remarkable. There was a second mutant allele identified in all six of those families. In half of them, there were intronic mutations that alter splicing, and I'll show an example of that in a moment. And in the other half, in three of them, there are structural variants. So I think it demonstrates the idea that if there's a single loss of function allele in a recessive gene, it's likely the second one's present, you just have to look for it. So here's an example of an intronic mutation that Prasad identified from the genome sequencing. This is looking at splicing between exon 11 and exon 12 of RP group 1. And you can tell based on next generation sequencing that there are something like 25,000 reads that have this junction in them in the MIDI gene assay that Prasad was using to interrogate this particular mutation. The mutation he was studying is this change here, 263 bases into, sorry, back into this intron between exons 11 and 12. And it's 13 bases, turns out, from what happens to be a novel cryptic exon that gets activated by this mutation here. And when you put that mutation in the metagene you're testing to see if it alters splicing, it does. Now you can tell the great majority of transcripts have junctions between this exon 11 prime or 11 B and 11, and not the normal exon 12. And inclusion of this extra cryptic exon based on this mutation causes a frame shift and a loss of functional view. We would never have been able to predict this because this is in 263 base, this variant is 263 base pairs upstream of the junction at exon 12, and it's 13 base pairs from the exon junction. So there was no prediction program at least that we've been able to use that was able to predict this would alter splicing. So you really need empiric data for that, and I'll come back to this idea a little later as well. Here's an example of one of the structural variants that Farzad found. We had a couple of families where there were duplications, tandem duplications of some of the early exons in the RP group 1 gene. Uh, one family had just a duplication of exon, canonical exon 2. In this family, there was a duplication of what was annotated as exons 1 and 2 of RP group 1. When we saw that, we thought, how does that cause disease? If you just duplicate the first exons, you could still, in theory, trans transcribe the normal transcript. But looking at our human retinal transcriptome data from our work and from others, groups like Chris and others, um, we realized actually there was an unannotated upstream exon in RP group 1, so that the annotated transcript isoforms for RP group 1 in human genome data are incorrect, and there's actually an upstream exon, exon 1. So now this family has duplications of exon 2 and 
three, and those are out of frame and causing no real. So, so I think our hypothesis was correct that you, know, you can solve 56 percent percent of patients with small nucleotide variants. You get about 30 percent of patients if you combine those coding small nucleotide variants with either structural variants or non-coding mutations. I said there's a small percentage I'm going to leave in there for finding new disease genes, although I think that's going to be the minority. So we're doing pretty well now. We're finding the genetic cause of disease if we push it far enough and hard enough for 80-90% of patients. So we're trying to now deploy that clinically, although there's some challenges there. And we're also focusing on what's the remaining causality in this 12% or so, and these are you know, rounded numbers, um, that are unsolved. And I think, well, you know, if you have a significant portion of patients, maybe up to 30%, who have single non-coding mutations in trans with a coding mutation, why wouldn't you have patients who have two non-coding mutations causing disease? So that's the hypothesis we're trying to test for this remaining 12%. Um, and we call this our elusive genetic causality or elusive genes project. We've done part of this work in collaboration with David Gamm. He actually coined that term with us. So we want to test that process. Do patients have two non-coding mutations that cause a very soon? But the challenge is, how do you find these? Because as I'll show you in a moment, if you do whole genome sequencing alone, you find too many possible genetic solutions because there are just too many variants in the introns to interpret. So the hypothesis we're really testing is could we combine whole genome sequencing data with an orthogonal data source to filter down to the genetic cause of disease. And the orthogonal data source we chose is RNA sequencing data from iPS-derived retinal organoids derived from patients that we're trying to study to see if we can solve these elusive families. So we didn't pick a family that has two non-coding mutations to start with. We thought we would test our method first. In a test case, in this family with two children who have cone dystrophy, they have defects in central vision. They're not night blind, but rather quite photophobic, typical cone dysfunction. When we did our panel-based Jedi sequencing or Holexome sequencing, we found one loss of function mutation in the CMGB3 gene, which is a known cone dystrophy disease gene. So we're looking for a mutation in CMGB3 as the second one. But rather than just look for that, we thought we would test our method combining whole genome sequencing data with RNA sequencing data to see if we could identify the cause of disease here. So as I said, if you do whole genome sequencing, you don't solve these families. So here we did whole genome sequencing on all five members of this family. We have a lot of power for filtering by segregation because we had two effectives. And yet we still wind up, if you filter for rare variants based on nomad database allele frequencies, we still wind up with 3,200 rare variants and 642 genes as potential genetic solutions. So you can't tell what the cause of disease is just from the whole genome data. You need another way to filter. And maybe when nomad grows and there are more, there are 150,000 genomes instead of 15,000 genomes, we'll have more allele frequency data and we'll be able to filter better. But I still think we're going to need empiric data to solve these families. So where do we do the RNA sequencing from? You know, I said we're, we're going to do this from iPS-derived retinal organoids, but it, for those of you who worked with those organoids, you know they're finicky, they're expensive, and it takes a long time to make them. So we first said, well, could we do this from blood or skin? And unfortunately, the answer is no. Um, we plotted here the expression levels of the known inherited retinal disease genes in gray in the background, and superimposed on that, in the case of blood in red, expression levels of those genes. And you can see that blood does not represent gene expression from the retina very well, not a surprise. Unfortunately, skin doesn't either, although it's a little bit better. In collaboration, as I said, with David Gamm and Beth Kapowski and David's group, we made iPS-derived organoids from the family members in this family. 
if you mature them long enough, in this case up to 160 days, they make these impressive outer segments and laminate beautifully like the retina. So we chose this time point for our new sequencing analysis. And as you can imagine, those iPS derived retinal organoids recapitulate normal retinal expression much better than skin or blood. So this is what we use for our studies. And this worked very nicely when we compared the RNA sequencing results from the two affected individuals from the unaffected sibling in this family. We found 180 events of differential splicing and 148 genes. And when we compared that data to the data from whole genome sequencing, there's only one overlap that makes sense. It seems to be three. And again, it's one of these deep intronic mutations that activates inclusion of a cryptic exon in the transcript leading to a null. In this case, the variant is 2,000 base pairs into this intron, and it creates a new splice site, including a now exon 14B in the transcript, which is disrupts the gene. You can see this, sorry, by a PCR analysis in the transcripts that the in the two affected individuals, we can identify the inclusion of this extra exon, sequence those bands, you can see that the extra exon is included. And here are what we think the consequences are in the CGB3 gene. So the coding allele we have should create a truncation allele, and this now new intronic mutation leading to inclusion of exon 14B should also create an early truncation. Since these are both internal to the gene, we expected those to be null alleles. Turns out they're not, although they're still defective. If you go back to the iPesterized retinal organoids that we have, you grow them longer. These are 260 days old. You look at an uninfected parent versus an infected sibling, you can see that they both make outer segments. And the parent, CNGV3, is localized in these outer segments of cones, cones identified by Conopsin staining. In the affected individual, there's still a green signal for CNGV3, but it's not in the intercept. So I don't understand exactly why we're still getting some expression of these truncated proteins. Clearly, nonsense mediated decay does not work in all frame shift alleles, but the truncated proteins don't normal localize normally to photoreceptor segments underlying disease. So we've solved this family. And I think this approach of combining whole genome sequencing data with RNA sequencing data is very promising. We're working on this now in five other elusive gene families to see if we can solve some of these families by finding two non-coding mutations. And hopefully we'll be able to tell you that story at a future time. We did go back and say, okay, now that we know there's this deep intronic mutation, 2,000 base pairs into the intron in CNGV3, could we have found that in advance? Could we have used spice prediction programs to interrogate the whole genome sequencing data and have picked that out without having to go through all the work of studying and making the organoids and studying them? And unfortunately, the answer is no. We still, this is still a limitation in our field, and to me, it's one of the challenges in genetics in our field, and we're trying to work on addressing this. If you take the three, 3,200 variants, rare variants, down by whole genome sequencing that segregate by disease in this family, and you put them through a splice prediction program that uses three different uh, algorithms, as listed here, to, to determine if a variant could alter splicing, 532 of those were shown to have a high probability of altering splicing. Now, the variant that turned out to be pathogenic in CNGV3 was included, but there's no way to pick that out from the 532. If you use Splice AI, which is a neural network tool to, to uh, identify by Illumina, where they actually predicted in advance the effect of any variant in the genome on splicing, eight of the rare variants identified by whole genome sequencing met the threshold for having altering splicing, but that did not include the, what we found to be the pathogenic allele in CNGV. So I think we're left with a challenge in our field here that I'm pretty sure that something like 10 to 12% of patients with inherited renal disease 
has genetic causality of two non-coding mutations, you know, a deep intronic mutation that alters splicing, an upstream mutation that alters gene expression, a structural variant. But I think it's really going to be hard to find those based on whole genome sequencing data alone. And I think one of our challenges going forward is to improve our ability to interpret the genome data. In the meantime, while we're working on those bioinformatic tools, I think we're going to need to use empiric studies, either RNA sequencing of iPS derived retinal organoids, or maybe higher throughput studies to interrogate potential spice altering variants in the lab. But we're going to need those empiric data. All right. So that's our summary of genetics. I think we understand the genetic architecture of inherited retinal diseases fairly well now. I don't think there are going to be many new inherited retinal disease genes to find, but we have some challenges ahead of us because we now really need to focus on the combinations of coding and non-coding alleles as causality. And that's certainly one of the main activities in our group at the moment. Okay, so how do we now use that information to turn that into therapies. These are the clinical trials I mentioned that are in progress. You know, it's really gratifying to see that there's evidence that there are going to be other gene therapy successes for inherited retinal diseases in addition to the RPE65 success. It's a very nice paper earlier this year, early data from one of the RPGR gene therapy trials. And it doesn't look that impressive. We look at the improved sensitivity, so this is baseline for this patient following treatment, their ability to detect light in their macula improves, right? their sensitivity improves, and that happened in all three of these treated patients. It doesn't look that impressive in these pictures and from the microperimetry studies, but these patients can tell they can see better and they, they report that. So I think there's another success coming and I think there'll be more AAB mediated gene therapy, which as I said, I think can remain in the mainstay of uh, therapeutic work in our field. But there are a significant number of patients that we can't treat with AAB gene therapy. These are patients who have disease due to mutations in large genes that are too big for the AAB cargo capacity, and mutations in dominant genes that cause dominant gate of function effects. Dominant ones are a little more challenging because the disease mechanisms remain to be determined for many of those disorders. We don't really know for dominant diseases how many are health and consistency or dominant negative versus gain of function. So to focus just on the recessive for the remainder of this talk in the next 10 or 15 minutes to finish up. Um, you know, something 12% of inherited retinal disease genes have coding sequences that are too large for AAB. But that includes the most common causes of inherited retinal disease. It's up to 90 for severe early onset disease, H2A for typical rod cone degeneration, and ABCA4 for cone rod and macular disorders. Mutations in those three genes account for something like a third of all IRD cases. So we need to approach these for sure. And this is where the genome editing and innocent cell nucleotide therapies come in. So again, to pick up another case, um, KS is a 50 year old with Usher syndrome, typical story of hearing loss as a child, developed rod cone degeneration in her early 20s. Manages really well, actually very inspiring as most many patients are. She's a teacher for children with special needs, even though she has special needs herself. And she's having more trouble. She wants to keep teaching. She loves to help her students, but she needs more and more defense on visual assistive devices in school and it came from mobility. And she wants to know, can anything be done to help her keep teaching? Her vision, central vision is starting to be affected. As you can see, 2070 and 2200. Her visual field is quite constricted, as I'll show you in a moment. She has two mutations in the H2A gene, including the most common mutation in the gene, the C2299-DEL-G, which is the most common mutation causing H2A-associated disease, and it's an exon 13 of H2A. Here are our results from her exam. As I said, she has a very constricted visual field, consistent with her autofluorescence results. There's some outer retinal structure remaining present in the macula, but it's already attenuated. But still, she wants to know anything can be done to help them. So, h 
feature, as I mentioned, is a challenge because it won't, the coding sequence won't fit in AAV. Coding sequence for H2A is 15,000 base pairs long, so it's going to be very hard to shrink that into a 4K AAV. So there's been a lot of attention now on exon skipping as potential therapy. Can you skip, for example, exon 13 using genome editing or an antigen silicon nucleotide and res result with at least partially functional protein? And there's an interest in that because it turns out exon 13, as is true for about 20 other exons, is in frame in H2A. And it also has the highest mutational load in mouth mass. And there's a thought that if you get if you remove exon 13, which is in frame, you might retain H2A function because exon 13 encodes some of these 10 laminin EGF repetitive domains. And overall, you can see that the H2A protein structure has many repetitive domains, including 35 fibronectin 3 like domains. So the idea is if you can take out some of these repetitive domains, keep the protein in frame, maybe you result with at least a partially functional protein. So that's the hypothesis we wanted to test to see if we could help develop therapy for h 2 associated disease. You could do this with antisocialic nucleotides, and there's a clinical trial sponsored by ProQR in progress for this. We decided to focus on CRISPR-Cas9-based approaches, primarily now initially focusing on genome editing in collaboration with the company Editas Medicines. But you could certainly use base editing or now prime editing for this as well. And just command on a group and two more studying base editing for this as well. So to me, the first question is, if you get rid of exon 13, do you result with a functional protein? And although there's a clinical trial in progress, that has not, I think, been thoroughly evaluated. So that's what Chin Lu and the postdoc in a group, Nachi Penzi, set out to do. They said, okay, if you cut out by like CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing, exon 13, which would restore the reading frame in the case of this 2299-DEL-G common mutation, would a functional protein result. You can do that in mice, because H2A is required for retinal co function in mice, just like it is in people. You can make H2A knockout mice. You can see that the that's not H2A isn't present in the inner and outer hair cells, in the cochlea, as early as day one, and those stereocilia hair cell bundles don't form in the absence of H2A. So it's a very nice early bioassay. And H2A is also expressed in the retina, in the transition zone, and is required for retinal function in mice, but it takes about 20 months for the mice to develop retinal stimulation. So cochlear readout is probably better although there are other biomarkers of H2A function in the retina, which I'll try to show you. So, as I said, Nancy Penzi, a postdoc, made mice that lack exon 12, which is the equivalent of the human exon 13, and asked, can they see, can they hear? And fortunately, the answer is yes. They have both normal cochlear development and hearing and normal retinal structure. The cochlear data are here. So, you know, if you don't have H2A, you don't make cochlear hair cells. If you add back an allele of this delta exon 12 allele onto the knockouts, you make beautiful hair cells and have normal hearing function. In the retina, we don't entirely know why, but in H2A knockouts, cone optimates are mislocalized. And again, if you add back a delta 12 allele to the knockout background, Options are properly localized. So the answer is that exon 12 is at least partially dispensable, exon 12 in the mouse, exon 13 in the human, is partially dispensable for H2A function. So to me, that means we can move forward with this idea of skipping exon 13 to treat the C2299 del G mutation and other mutations in exon 13. As I said, we've been doing this work in collaboration with Editas Medicines. While we were working on this, testing the function of the delta 13 human or delta 12 mouse allele, Editas was working on developing the guide RNAs needed to 
cut in exons, sorry, in introns 12 and 13 to effectively remove exon 13 from the human gene. They screened a number of guide RNAs in these introns and picked up ones that had high activity and no off-target effects. I'm going to skimp on discussing the off-target work here and get back to that in another example. There's some very nice data from in vitro work showing that if you use the guide RNA selected in a human cell line or in human retinal explants, you get effective editing. In this case, editing can cause a deletion of exon 13 or an inversion, which would be productive edits. Those are the two yellow and orange bars in this graph here. And that results in significant expression of an RNA that's lacking exon 13. There are some unproductive edits. If you make small indels or have other genetic results like translocations, but I think you get significant productive editing using this approach. And as I mentioned, if you then try this in human retinal explants using an AAV that encodes the guide RNAs driven by U6 promoter and SA Cas9 driven by retina photoreceptor specific promoter GRT1, you do get reasonable editing, reasonable expression of the delta 13 H2A mRNA. So based on this preclinical work, Veritas is very interested in moving this towards clinical development. Just to show, to close here, to finish up in the next couple of minutes, that this idea isn't crazy, that bringing genome editing in vivo isn't just a pipe dream, but actually is happening. I'll come back to the case I started with just to finish up. Remember, this is the now 15-year-old girl with light perception or hand motions vision who had severe early onset retinal disease. And it turns out this is due to mutations in the CEP290 gene, a deep intronic mutation, which is the most common mutation, as I'll show you, and a frame shift. Mutations in CEP290 are the most common cause of severe early onset retinal disease. But again, the gene is too big for gene therapy with a cutting sequence of 7,400 base pairs. And this deep intronic mutation in intron 26 is the most common single mutation and is present in about 10% of early onset severe retinal disease cases. Because it's in an intron, it's a good target for gene editing, right? It causes disease by activating inclusion of a cryptic exon in between exons 26 and 27, just like the cases I described earlier, um, which leads to premature truncation of the protein. You can use a technique to present, prevent that inclusion of the cryptic exon, either in innocence oligo or in this case, uh, gene editing. You could prevent that mutation from disrupting gene function. So in this case, Editas, again, focusing on an intron, identified guide RNAs that effectively remove that intronic mutation from the intron, restoring normal. And again, they're using the same approach I just described for H2A. They have an AAB, which is called Edit 101, coding the two guide RNAs they selected in SACAS9. They've tested this both in humanized mice, and I'm just going to show the non human primate data here, using, in this case, a surrogate set of guides. You can see the Cas9 is expressed just in photoreceptors, and you get reasonable levels of productive editing regional level, levels of AAV injected in these primates. So I think this is very promising for clinical use. They also did a very comprehensive specificity assessment to make sure that this genome editing approach is safe, because the risk here is off target effects, damaging the genome in other locations. They used three steps in silico modeling, digenome seq on just naked DNA, and guide seq in cultured cells. And they found no of target, no detectable of target activity, no verifiable detectable of target activity of the two guide RNAs selected. I'm just going to show one of those assays. It's simplest. This is the digenome seq or Cas9, and the guides in question are making genome DNA and analyze the cut sites. In contrast to a controlled 
guides, you can see the two guides used for H2A here, have either no or only one off target site in the initial assay, and this off target activity was not able to be verified. So the EVIT 101 genome editing drug has no detectable or verifiable off target effects, and that leads to a phase one, two clinical trial of genome editing for sub 290 associated disease due to this interim 26 mutation, which is now in progress. The trial is called the Brilliance trial. As indicated here, goal is to enroll up to 18 subjects, initially adults, and then expanding to a pediatric group in a typical dose escalation form, the primary outcome being safety. But obviously, there's a lot of interest to see if there is also efficacy as assessed by multiple measures, including a visual function navigation test. The trial is being carried out at seven sites around the world with two surgical sites presently, one at our site at Mass Lanier, another at KCI Institute in Oregon. We're thrilled that this trial got started in March with the first subject being treated at KC. As you can see here, the trial was on hold for a while during the early stages of the pandemic, but I'm also very excited that We've now treated the second subject recently at Mass Near, and the trial has resumed activity. So I'm going to finish there. Sorry to be a few minutes over. Um, just to sum up, I think, you know, I think we can identify the genetic cause of disease for the majority of our patients now if we're willing to push our genetic diagnostic techniques to include neutronic mutations. But we have a real challenge ahead of us in terms of our field of understanding of chronic mutations better. And I think genius genetic therapy show great promise for treating inherited mental disorders. I think we need to push forward strongly with AAV, but we really need to focus on these alternative technologies like genome editing, antisense oligos, because we really need to develop therapies for all genetic forms of inherited mental disease, because our patients are us. As I said, I get to work with a wonderful group of people um, in the Ocular Genomics Institute. Um, I pointed out some of the work that Kinga did, the contributions that Jason and Rachel make in terms of lab-based and clinical work. It's really a pleasure. We have a wonderful group of postdocs and techs and students in the lab, a fantastic bioinformatics group, a really important genetic counseling team, and some wonderful collaboration. Oh, sorry, a fantastic genomics coordinator sequencing, and some wonderful collaborations at the road and the Institute of Physics. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Eric, thank you so much. Uh, wonderful presentation. I encourage anybody who wants to ask the question to send me a, a message by chat, and I will try to coordinate uh, those questions. So uh, who is going to be the brave? I will say Anand. I'm sure he has a question. Uh, I, yeah, I was just typing it up, actually, that I have a question. So you, you caught me ahead of time. I have actually two, but I'll ask only one first. So uh, Eric. Wonderful talk. You have pioneered really a lot of things in genetic diagnosis and and this research. I, I, you know, I want to hear your thoughts on something that has bothered me for a very long time. Uh, we in inherited disease research have focused now. I mean, when we had large families, it was very easy to find linkage and say this is the cause of disease. But later on, when we have small families where it's very hard to know, what we do is we find something in a gene that is a known gene that's supposed to be, and we say, ah, this is the disease gene. On the other hand, uh, it's also possible that there are many other mutations in different sets of genes that may actually be the disease causing, and that that particular one may or may not have anything to do with disease because for example, we have done whole exome sequencing of a large number of pa patients, and what we find is you have single mutations in genes, but you have a heterozygous mutations in many genes in same pathway. Similarly, many times you find mutations which are in two or three or four retinate genes, sometimes even homozygous mutations in three, four different genes. So. In many of those cases, if we get stuck with the first one that we find, we think that is the disease causing gene and we may be really telling the patients or the counseling the patient in a wrong way because the second retinate gene or third retinate gene could be easily the one 
or there could be two or three different gene uh, gene mutations in two or three different genes heterozygous may have a combinatorial impact on the function of that particular pathway which could lead to disease similarly uh, we could have mutations in enhancer regions or promoter regions that we have not tested, which could also cause disease. So what do you think about uh, what, what, what has been bothering me and how to really approach some of those issues? And, and uh, yeah, I want to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. So, you know, Anand, I think you're pointing out some of the challenges in genetics in general, not just in inherited retinal diseases. Um, we're very lucky to be members of the Broad Institute in the Medical Population Genetics Group, where there are MPG uh, meetings every week. And this topic comes up frequently for not just inherited renal diseases, but for genetic disorders in general. And, and I think there's sort of several layers of answers to your question. First, you know, the idea that you can have potentially pathogenic variants in multiple genes it's one of the reasons why we've been advocating comprehensive genetic testing for a number of years, right? This is why panel-based tests, where you say, oh, this person has you know, RP, let's look at the X number of RP genes, is the wrong approach. Because you miss things you don't expect. And we know in our data, at least 10% of the time, we find the genetic cause of disease in a gene that wasn't originally described as, say, the RP gene, but it's the cause of disease. You know, there's phenotype expansion all the time. So I think you're correct. We need to look at at least all the inherited renal disease genes at once, initially, so we don't mistake diagnoses. I do think, even though you can have, as you say, multiple variants or, or variants in multiple potential retinal disease genes in, an, in a single individual, I do think there are still primary causes of these Mendelian disorders, right? That if you really parse it out, you can find in a recessive case, a single gene with two pathogenic alleles. Sometimes that takes empiric work. Sometimes you can't tell only by bioinformatic analyses. You can't distinguish variants in gene A from variants in gene B. But when we've taken that into the lab, and pushed it, we almost always find out, oh, the variants of gene A actually aren't pathogenic. It's really gene B. That said, I think what you're really alluding to, I'm going to try to read between your lines a little bit, is that it's very likely there are genetic modifiers of disease severity for inherited renal diseases, as well as many other genetic Mendelian diseases. So that while there's a primary cause of disease, you can have the severity of that phenotype modified by variants in other genes, especially, as you suggested, if they're in the same biochemical pathway. And King of Wiyakowski in our group is really interested in this topic and is really now trying to explore modifiers of disease severity for common genetic causes of inherited virus. And, and again, this is not specific to inherited retinal disease by any means. Right? This is a general theme. It's the intersection of rare and dealing disease genetics and common complex disease genetics. And I think that intersection could turn out to be very, very interesting. Thank and with regard, to, with regard to regulatory variants, you're completely right. I focused on splicing variants. But we have variants in particular to regulatory elements that we think are pathogenic and we're going to need to explore those fully for sure. So thanks for a great question. Thank you, Eric. Let's just move to uh, Susie Sue and then uh, Jim Ho. Hi. Um, it was a wonderful talk. Um, I have a question. Is there any uh, prediction tool that you use, use to determine like whether exon skipping will result in a functional um, protein in any kind of any kind of mutation in the genes? Um, the, the real answer, the sort of main layer answer is no. You know, what you can do is look at the gene and see are there deletions of specific exons that have been reported to be pathogenic. 
So a classic example for Usher 2A that I was describing is there are patients with deletions of exon 27 that cause disease. So we know you can't skip exon 27 therapeutically, right? But beyond that kind of general approach, you can't a priori tell if removal of an exon, removal of a motif from a protein is going to disrupt protein function. I think you have to do the empiric work. You need to develop some kind of system, hopefully something relatively quick and easy, cell-based system, where you can systematically take out the exons one at a time and see which ones result in functional protein function. And, and that's exactly why Chen and Nachi spent so much effort to test the exon 13 hypothesis so, so thoroughly in mice, right? We wanted to be sure, even though it seemed like a great idea, we wanted to be sure that taking out exon 13 wouldn't totally ablate protein. I think you need the empiric work. Jim? Yeah, uh, uh, really exciting. Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering if the treasure trove of genetic information that you get might also lead to the possibility of pharmacological intervention as opposed to genetic uh, intervention, as happened for, uh, example, cystic fibrosis. Yep. Oh, absolutely. Um, so I'm going to answer slightly differently just because it's on the forefront of my mind. We study another genetic type of inherited retinal disease due to mutations in RNA splicing factors. We're very interested in, right? How come if you mess up components of a spliceosome, you get retina-specific disease? What we're really driving for there is try to understand your test hypothesis that altered splicing causes disease. Because if we can, we think there's going to be commonality between the six different genetic forms of RNA splicing factor associated RP. And hopefully that'll point to a pathway that can be potentially treated with drugs instead of having to do gene therapy for each individual one. I think the same kind of thing can be done, you know, if, if Kinga and others in the field, she's not the only person doing this, can identify modifiers of disease severity, you know, you can have positive and negative modifiers. If you, have, if you find a genetic modifier that reduces disease severity, finding a drug that affects that pathway could be a very effective approach to therapy. So absolutely. And there are great examples of this in other fields, right? The PCSK9 uh, example in hyperlipidemia is a, it's a classic example of that. So yes, as we understand all the con genetic contributors to disease severity for inherited retinal disease, I think that's going to identify potentially druggable pathways for sure. All right, let's just move to uh, Professor Zak and then again to Brother Anand. <laughs> hi, Eric. Hi, Eric. Like everyone said, great talk. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Hello. Hi. Um, wanted to start with the general, probably unanswerable questions, maybe parallel to uh, uh, Nan's. But, you know, as you well know, since you study such diseases, many of the genes that cause uh, retinal degeneration are not at all specific to the retina. And they're expressed throughout the body. So I was wondering if you had any, you know, broad thoughts and insights into, you know, ways we should think about that and ways to study it more. And then in a more practical question, since you ended talking about off-target effects, what what is the FDA's thinking now? Have they made clear what kind of off-target effects would they tolerate, or how how much do they require to show lack of off-target effects? So for the broad to the specific. Thanks. Great. Great. Um, so I think, as you know, and this may be why you're asking the question, one of the things we study in our group is the group of disease, some of the disorders, some of the inherited retinal degenerative disorders caused by mutations in genes that are ubiquitously, ubiquitously expressed. And we're trying to understand this conundrum that you raised, how come they cause retina-specific disease? And I think we're making progress in that direction in two of our different projects. And it, in one case, I think it highlights there are, you know, there's specific biology in the retina, either due to retinal function or susceptibility to 
chronic stress that our weak points or choke points in retinal function, and if you mess up a gene that's involved in one of those pathways, you could get retina-specific disease and perhaps not disrupt other function. Um, I'm trying to figure out what I can say and what's, what the postdocs have been working so hard on these projects. Don't want to hear said publicly quite yet. Um, I think I'm going to leave it at that. Okay. Uh, well, we can wait till your next talk. That's okay. <laughs> but for others, for in other cases, I actually think it's going to be a little bit of serendipity, right? So I think in the case of RNA splicing factor, RP, when we do transcriptome analyses of retinas and RPE from animal models or cell-based models of those disorders, you know, we, we think if you mess up with an RNA splicing factor, you're going to mess up splicing. So how come you mess up splicing just in the retina and not everywhere else? Well, it turns out you mess up splicing the same in those models of disease in all different tissues. I think the reason you get retina-specific disease is you happen to mess up a transcript that's really needed for the retina, whereas you don't mess up a transcript that's really needed for our liver function or muscle function. And we can't tell why there's specific susceptibility to those splicing changes in the retina. So I'm wondering if it's just bad luck that you happen to hit a critical transcript. So, so I think it's going to be combinations of those things. You're either elucidating unique aspects of retinal biology, or just by happenstance, you happen to be perturbing a specific a pathway in the retina in a way that's different from perturbations in other tissues. Uh, Off-target effects. Um, you know, we've been collaborating with Editas on these projects, which we're very excited about, but we have not been involved in the discussions with the FDA. So I don't know what the specific guidelines are. My thought would be Editas did an amazing job with the preclinical work for these two programs and not only found guides that are active, but then multiple different, by multiple different methods, guides for which they could not detect off target activity. So to me, that's the, the the new bar. Can't find any off-target activity in the lab. Allows you to move forward with clinical work. Thanks. Anna. And this is the perfect time when he's muted. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I think my brother Chris will be happy with this uh, this question. Actually, it is uh, more to please him and also sort of to get. Uh, Eric, your insights. Uh, you know, one other thing that, you know, another thing that has always been in my mind for a very long time is, is, is the use of gene dependent therapies or gene therapies which are targeted for one gene at a time and there are literally dozens of them in progress. We already saw a million dollar price tag policy wise. Uh, for RP65, which was probably the easier one, and maybe the photoreceptor ones will be much, much harder to even target. And if you are successful, I don't know what the price tag is going to be. And if we have to spend millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, basically, for research, and then end up uh, the whole Medicare or whatever system is going to go bankrupt in doing the treatment for few inherited disease patients. Why not think of gene independent approaches by some means like pharmacology? I think Jim asked about it earlier and Don is doing that. Others are doing that. Chris, of course, is doing it. I think in all of these cases, AAV can also be utilized probably to target some specific pathways or, or, or gene independent sort of uh, signals that could not target just one gene at a time, but maybe take care of at least five, six, 10, 20 of them. So I think my, some of the issue, philosophical issue with this is, yes, it's very nice, wonderful, but for public point, how many people are going to be able to afford it and how long it'll take? So I, I want to hear your thoughts and maybe, maybe the small molecule drugs, the kind that Chris and others are doing, uh, can reach places in Himalayas or in uh, African jungles where 
you may not be able to administer gene therapy so easily. So Anand, of course, we should be working on all possible approaches to therapies for these disorders. I like the gene and genetic approach as a paradigm because I think it's powerful and it's attractive to me to address the underlying genetic cause of disease. But you could do that if, if we can find a drugs that also ameliorate disease progression for multiple different causes of disease, that would be fabulous. And I, and I like the way you phrased it, because for a while in the field, there was this idea that you could develop a neuroprotective agent that would work for all different forms of disease, and I don't think that's the case. I think that's naive, right? I think the kind of way you constrained it of saying, maybe we can find small molecule drugs that, that work for a class of genetic causes, whether it's five or 10 or 20, that to me seems much more likely to be true. And obviously I think it's a great idea. And, and, it, and I was trying to answer the question earlier when I mentioned the RNA splicing factor RP, that that's exactly what we're trying to do in that setting, right? Those are, except for PF31, the others are relatively rare causes of disease. Our premise is if we can find this gene expression pathways that are perturbed by abnormal splicing that are common, and all of those forms of disease, that that could identify a common point for therapy instead of having to develop five separate therapies. So absolutely. And sure, if, if we can use AAV to deliver RDCVF and have an effective you know, neuroprotective effect for some subset of inherited neural disorders, that would be fabulous. Or if we could develop a small molecule drug for ABCA4 associated disease and maybe some of the other inherited macular dystrophies. Fantastic. So I, maybe I should emphasize that in my talk going forward that I'm not saying we should work on genetic therapies exclusively. I think we should work on genetically informed therapies that include gene augmentation or gene editing and other pharmacologic approaches. With regard to the financial question, it's obviously a tough one, but, and this is a little Pollyanna, Ish, but I feel like we can't not develop gene therapies for some forms of disease, disease just because we think they're going to be expensive. Right? We have to push this forward. What that means is our healthcare system is going to have to respond to fund these kinds of therapies for patients because they're potentially life altering. And the price is just going to have to come down right? to make it work. Thank you, Eric. Uh, so let's have a question from Dominique, and then the final comments, uh, we will go to John Flannery, who I hope pay attention. I, I doubt, but maybe. Dr. Pierce, Dr. Great, great talk. Uh, I have just one question. You, you mentioned that uh, there is some ongoing clinical trial for uh, gene therapy for guanyl cyclase. Um, do you, to your knowledge, uh, are there any promising uh, studies uh, with uh, when it comes to gene therapy for guanyl cyclase that are already approved or uh, or uh, they are already um, or they are considered to uh, to to, to uh, be used for 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 uh, some clinical trials soon? Except for this one, uh, one ongoing clinical, clinical trial that you that you mentioned. Right. So I had the GUCY2D in the pending category um, on purpose here. Sorry, I don't need to go back. You you got it right. Uh, so Shannon Boy and her colleagues in Gainesville, Florida, developed beautiful proof of concept data for gene augmentation therapy for GUCY2D associated retinal disease. Mutations in GUCY2D cause severe early onset disease. It's a great gene therapy target. That therapy was originally licensed by a large pharma company who were working on clinical development. I, and I, the pending here is because on clinicaltrials.gov, that trial is listed, listed as acting, active, sorry, but not recruited. I believe I understand from Shannon that she has started a, a biotech company and gotten the rights to that therapy back. So 
so that the sponsor of that trial may change. But I would say based on their preclinical data, that's very promising, and I hope it moves forward. And I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Okay, so we're going to John and uh, Tony uh, will comment at the end, but we wanted to hear from a uh, very famous Dr. Flannery. I'd like to thank Chris for starting a new tradition of ambushing somebody to conclude the talk without telling them in advance. And that I should have been ready for that because he did that to Kathy Bose Rickman while I was talking, but I forgot. Anyway, uh, thanks very much, Eric. I think Eric's talk was excellent in one many ways, but one unique way is that, you know, Eric's very rare species that he's a pediatric ophthalmologist, as he mentioned, he sees patients. And then he's a geneticist, so he can go to the lab and figure out what's wrong with the patients. Then he'll work on the therapies in his lab and also with company collaborators and then go full circle back to the patient. So uh, some of us do one or two of those things. Uh, Eric's very uh, unique in that he does many of them extremely well. So I'd like to thank him for the perspective that very few people could add in this morning's talk. Thank You're you. very kind, John. Thank you. Tony? Eric, that was an amazing talk, uh, and I learned so much. I just wanted to point out that, that Henry Clausen, who's here at UCI, uh, they're in a phase 2B finish uh, treating uh, people with RP, with human retinal progenitor cells injected into the vitreous. And that therapy is hopefully one that could be used if it gets approved in the phase three to help slow the disease in many of these patients while you're developing the genetic approach. Hopefully Christoph and his group can find pharmacologic or other means to treat these patients. But I'm happy to say that it looks like some of these patients will be able to get some help um, with this therapy? Uh, you know, I, I didn't even talk about stem cell approaches for therapies. I think you're correct. The, the trial that Ann Clausen and others are doing, certainly a possible approach to neuroprotection, which I think is the goal on the intravitreal injection. I didn't put on here that there are trials of uh, stem cell retinal progenitor cell and stem cell transplants with a different goal, right? So Renuron is sponsoring a study to inject the same human retinal progenitor cells subretinally to see if they can repopulate the receptor layer. There are, I'm sure, many more stem cell studies coming based on the explosion work in the field. And hopefully all these approaches will work and we'll get to choose which ones to deploy for patients as we learn about how to use them best. So, thank you for the comment. Eric, I don't see uh, more questions, so let me have a one. Uh, nobody else was brave enough, I guess. Uh, so do you see those patients uh, with RP65 after treatment? Do, do you follow them? And how much really it changed their life in terms of navigation and things like that? And as you know, there was, uh, uh, you know, Ali and uh, Jacobson versus Bennett there were some differences in terms of how sustainable this therapy is. Could you comment on that from your personal practice? Sure. So I do see some of these patients, Chris, although Jason Commander is the designated surgeon for these post-approval cases at Mass Engineer, so he sees them more. But I was part of the group at Children's Hospital in Philly that started the initial phase one two trials sponsored by Center for Cellular Liquid Therapeutics at CHOP led by Jean Bennett and Al McGuire in 2007. So I, I have known some of these patients for more than 10 years. Um, but there is significant benefit to vision in many of the treated patients. I would say in general, especially if they're younger, although not exclusively. And my experience is that benefit is sustained. That you know, their improvement in life sensitivity and their ability to navigate, and in some cases, read, uh, is sustained for long periods of time of treatment, at least 10, I guess we're now 13 years old. So, you know, you might be able to measure 
as Sam and Artur did, a small decrement in light sensitivity five, six years after therapy. And again, that shouldn't be surprising, right? We're not going to get it perfect the first time with gene therapy. But even those patients they reported where there was some decrease in light sensitivity, their sensitivity was still much better than it was pre-treatment. So my, my anecdotal experience with patients is that's the case, that their benefits are sustained and their benefits provide significant improvement in quality of life. All right, let's join the, uh, me uh, with thanking uh, Eric for his wonderful talk. And Eric, thank you. Keep doing what you're doing. It's beautiful. Thanks very much, Chris. Thank you all. I really appreciate the time and thanks so much for your great questions.